All right, ladies and gentlemen, Kiwana Johnston. My father was the first man to ever love me. One of the things that he used to do for me that I loved was kiss my hand. He liked to hold my hand for no reason, so we'd be in the grocery store, I'd be in the shopping cart, he'd be holding my hand. But when he kissed my hand, he would kiss my fingers. And I liked that because it tickled. So I would laugh, and then he would laugh at my laugh, and then I would laugh at his laugh. He had this uh, gravelly red fox kind of voice. So when he laughed at my laugh, and I laughed at his, he would laugh harder, and then I would laugh harder. So that little kiss would last a good five minutes. Um, he was the first man to ever tell me that I was beautiful and that my chocolate skin was what made me beautiful despite what the world would tell me eventually. He was the first man to tell me that I was intelligent and that my intelligence would take me farther than my beauty. So needless to say, I was a daddy's girl. I wanted to be around him all the time. He was also the first man to ever choose me because he was not my biological father. He and my mother dated while she was in high school. And then, you know how high school dating goes, they broke up. She went away to the Marines, came back and was pregnant with me. But my biological father had no interest in being a parent. So that didn't last long. Her and my dad ran into each other again, started dating again, and by the time I was one, they had married. <clears throat> my mom and my dad were beautiful people. My mom was a little bit shorter than me, and at the time, probably no more than 100 pounds, but she was a Marine, so she had a Marine's body. Um, my dad was gorgeous as well. He was a boxer. <clears throat> people loved to be around the two of them because they had these magnetic personalities, and they, they liked to make other people laugh. So they always had a crowd of people around them that wanted just to be near them. And I was one of those people, but I mainly just wanted to be near my daddy. I love mom, but daddy was like the icing on the cake. In 1982, my father gets laid off from Chrysler <clears throat> and begins to keep me at home with him while my mom is at work waiting for the recall back. We used to do a couple of things that I remember <clears throat> were routine. We did everything from going to the park, playing in the middle of the floor, watching TV, but the routine thing that I loved the most was the concerts we would have in the living room. He would take the throw pillows off the couch, and the couch was my stage. It put me at his level, or as close to his level as I could get at three. Um, and then we had one of those old console record players that looked like a buffet. You lift up the top and you drop the record in. <laughs> that was my favorite piece of furniture. And it was my favorite because that's when everything started to feel like it was magic. One of our favorite songs was Atomic Dog by George Clinton. <laughs> and to this day, that song will come on and I'm like, shut up, don't talk to me. I would be on the couch, song come on, I got his jump rope, because he was a boxer, so he had one of those jump ropes with the leather-like material and the wooden handles, <clears throat> singing and barking at each other. <laughs> I would bark at him, he would bark at me, and a lot of times we would just bark through the whole song for no reason. <laughs> but that was our thing. Toward the end of the day, it was always, let's get ready to clean up the house. Mom is on her way home from work. So we would clean up, he would make dinner, and then go walk to the bus stop to get my mom and walk her back into the house. <clears throat> Needless to say, those two people made life perfect for me as a little girl. There was nothing that I felt other than love. And of course, at three, I didn't know how to explain it, but that's what it was. However, one day everything changed. My dad came into my room to tell me he was moving my bed into their room because my room was being painted. 
I'm all excited because I get to be in the big room with the grown people. That's all I know. One night, my mom is getting me ready for bed. We're brushing my teeth, and she has on this long burgundy nightgown with spaghetti straps. And it was probably polyester, but to me it was silk. <laughs> it was really soft. And I liked when she wore that particular nightgown because when I touched it, you know, it was soft to the touch and kids love those things. Or I would rub my face on it, just like hug her really close so I could rub my face on it. And then she smelled like this perfume that she wore that came in a little white bottle and had a <clears throat> label on it that had gardenias. So this night I asked if I can wear some of her perfume. I think I asked. Needless to say, she puts the perfume on me and I go to bed feeling good because I smell like my mom. Eventually drift off to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I wake up and there's this loud yelling. And the voice is familiar, but not so familiar because it's angry. And there's this smell. I didn't know what the smell was. It kind of covered up the smell of the perfume. I would later learn that that smell was liquor. When I open my eyes, <clears throat> my dad's sitting on top of my mother, and he has his fist pulled back and slams it right into her face. I scream out, Dad, and he says, turn around, boo, face the wall, go back to sleep. That was his name for me. Of course, I'm not turning around and facing the wall. I'm calling my parents. Between punches to the face and yelling and the wincing of my mom, he's saying to me, turn around and face the wall. He has one hand on her neck and he's choking her. And I can hear her squirming and gasping and trying to get words out. She does mutter, get off of me but it's not her voice either. <clears throat> I could barely make out their bodies because it was dark. There were no lights on, but I could see the outline of what was happening. And his face just keeps pounding and I keep calling out to them, his fist, I'm sorry. So eventually he eases his grip on my mom's neck and tells her, tell her you're okay. And to turn around and go back to sleep. So my mom says, I'm all right, pumpkin, go ahead and go back to sleep. Didn't go right back to sleep. I don't think I said much else. I was frozen in the bed. But I laid there that night at three years old watching my father rape my mother. <clears throat> Before I fell back to sleep, I could hear a rip and then the slamming of skin against skin and my mother let out this screech it was horrifying. Nothing in the house after that was ever the same. I don't remember any more music. I don't remember feeling loved anymore. Dad wasn't the same. Mom certainly wasn't the same. Eventually, my baby sister is born and that's the only other happy thing I remember after that night. My sister's about six months old and my mom leaves. She takes us both and leaves. I, at this time, am about four, four and a half. And I want to ask my mom for my dad, but I'm scared to ask for dad because he's not the same dad that he used to be. So I don't ask. Fast forward a few years and I learned that my dad is not my dad and I have another dad, father. I'm introduced to him and it becomes clear almost instantly why he's not around. And after I learned that my dad is not my dad, I want to call him. But how do you ask your mom to call him? So I don't. Eventually, I see him again, but when we see him, he's more harassing my mother than interested in his daughters. So we didn't see him often. Sometime around 17 years old, I'm selected as 
a national scholar with the con con Congressional Youth Congress. And I went a trip to Washington, D.C. to participate in that caucus. They called it a mock caucus. We did mock elections, held mock debates on the floor of the House of Representatives. And the entire time I'm there, I'm remembering my dad tell me how smart I am and how my intelligence would take me farther than my beauty. So I call my mom and I'm talking to her and she's all excited and I wanna call my dad. And I could never figure out if it's okay for me to want to call my dad, knowing what I know, even though I remember what he told me while I'm standing on the floor of the House of Representatives giving a speech. I won all kinds of accolades and awards at that um, conference. Didn't get to tell my dad about it. <clears throat> Fast forward, I am now 20 years old. I have started talking to my dad more. We talk about once a month. Um, and this day, he calls. I'm just getting home from work or class, I can't remember. But my dad knew I always had at least two jobs in college. I don't know why, don't ask. <laughs> was a full-time student and kept at least two jobs. Most of the time it was two jobs and an internship or two part-time jobs and some volunteer work. Just ridiculous. So my dad's asking me about school, which is the typical conversation that people have. But he has this cough. I'm like, Dad, can you get, go get that checked out? You've had it for a while. I don't want to talk about that. How's school? School is good. How are your grades? Good. Promise me you're going to finish college. I'm going to finish college, Dad. No, promise me you're going to finish college. So I say it again. I'm not convinced. Niggas always walking around here talking about they going to college, end up in college for 10 years and no degree. I want to hear the words. I promise you. <laughs> so, so I say, okay, I promise daddy I'm going to finish college. And don't let some sorry ass nigga convince you to get pregnant and drop out. I'm like, what? Okay, Dad. No, I want to hear the words. So I had to say the words. And then he starts talking, but it's like weird because we don't have these kinds of conversations. He says to me, I don't know what your mom told you about what happened between the two of us, but I want you to know that I love you and I'm sorry for not being there for you the way that you should, I should have been. Okay. Mom never really said anything about what happened to you. And he had made the comment that he didn't want me to form my opinion based on what he thought she had said. So she didn't say anything. Any opinion that we have, meaning my sister and I, is based on our interactions with you. So there were occasions when you made promises to show up and you didn't show up. You said you would send money. You didn't send money. We had been moved to California when we were really young, came back, and you would promise to come up from Ohio to visit us, but you'd be here all weekend and we would not hear from you. We would hear from our uncles and our cousins that you had been here all weekend and didn't call us. You wouldn't return our pages because people still had pagers back then. <laughs> didn't return our pages and didn't show up. And then I remember what I saw. So he kind of got quiet, and then he asked me what I saw. And I told him. He didn't interrupt me. He let me go through the whole thing. And at the end of it, he said, I didn't know you remembered that. I thought you were too young. And I said, no, Dad, I remember. I had a lot of nightmares about it. Those nightmares that I had would come and... I, can, I remember one at seven. I was seven years old, and I'm picturing, I'm dreaming of that night between my parents. And I wake up, and I want to call my dad, because when I was really little and I was afraid of something, my dad was the person that hugged me and held me close. But I had just dreamed about him raping my mother. So I'm in bed, stuck, and then I have to go to the bathroom, but I'm so afraid to move 
that I pee on myself. And I go to sleep like that. When I wake up the next morning, I try to hide my sheets and my clothes, and I'm embarrassed and ashamed, and I get in trouble for wetting the bed at seven years old, but I couldn't tell my mom why I wet the bed at seven years old. So, <clears throat> yeah, Dad, I remember. I didn't forget. He apologized to me for what I had seen and for what he had done and for failing me. A couple days after that phone call, I get another call, and it's my mom telling me that my dad is in the hospital in a coma. Within a week of that phone call, we were pulling my dad off of life support, and he was gone. About a week or two after that, I'm talking to my mom, and she's telling me about this conversation that she had with him a couple of weeks ago. And in the conversation, he apologized to her for always accusing her of trying to turn my sister and I against him and telling us about what had happened between the two of them. And he apologized for stalking her because he stalked her for years. And he apologized for raping her. In that conversation, my mother and I quickly realized that he called her after he got off of the phone with me to apologize because he had learned in the conversation with me that she had never done half of the things that he accused her of doing. My mom says, you know, after your dad died, I realized how much I still loved him and that the only reason I left is because I had to. I didn't want you and your sister thinking that was the way to grow up and I didn't want to live like that. It took another good 10 years for me to reconcile the fact that I had all these great memories of my dad that I loved. And when I hear George Clinton, it's still daddy and me on the couch in the living room and nobody else. But then for a long time, I had these nightmares, too. And when you're a little girl and you want to reach out to your dad, how do you decide if it's OK to love a person that you know did this thing? I had never seen violence before. I certainly didn't know what rape was. I didn't have the words to call it rape at three years old, but that's what it was. I kept my promise to dad. I became the first person in his family and my mom's family to graduate from college. Not long after I graduated from college, my mother graduated with a bachelor's degree. Then she decided to up me a couple of times <laughs> <laughs> and earned two master's degrees and became an educator, which was something that she had always wanted to do, but she put it on the back burner so that she could raise my sister and I. And a lot of the conflict for me was how do I love my mom and this person that did this thing to my mom? I had enough presence of mind to know how much sacrifice she had made for us in raising us. I just didn't know that that was the word that you would use. Eventually, I figured out it is okay to love your dad and love those memories because he's yours. One of the last things that he said to me in the last conversation that we had was, no matter what anybody tells you, no matter what DNA says or anything else, you belong to me. You are mine. So there are things that he said to me when I was little and even in that last conversation that I could recall when I was going through something and I needed it. So, <clears throat> Dad was the first man to ever love me, the first man to ever choose me, and the first real life monster I ever met and I still had to balance all of that. 
part of being an adult is learning that people are humans. Some of us have darker sides than others. But you gotta love the person for who they are and you gotta hold on to the good as much as you hold on to the bad. Kiwana Johnstone. That's a lot to think about, isn't it?